welcome. I'm Sarah Cruz. I am a quality advisor for NJSOC, the statewide after school network. And I'm here with Diane Jenko, our esteemed executive director. <laughs> and we're at Diane's house. Um, if you're not familiar, if you've not known, Diane is an avid gardener and she is often in her garden. And we always hear about these wonderful things. And today we're gonna get an opportunity to walk through and see the fabulous things going on here at her garden. And at the same time, she's gonna be talking to us about how you can use some of the concepts of being outside and gardening in your after school programs. So this week or this month of May is celebrate outdoors, celebrate after school outdoors in the garden state. And this has been going on for like 12 years. I think 12 or 13, yeah. So Diane, tell us where did celebrate after school outdoors in the garden state come from? Like why why do we do this and why in May? Well, we live in the Garden State and May is the most marvelous month of our year. I'm from Buffalo, New York. I didn't even know it could look like this in the spring. We, I mean, we have snow in May. So this was like amazing when I moved here, but I had read a book um, called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Love. And it was when, if you figure about 13 years ago, that's when screen time with kids was just starting. And it was getting scary. Like all of a sudden there were no kids in my neighborhood outside. I never saw kids on bicycles. They weren't at the playground. Um, I remember I went back to where I grew up and took my nephew on a water hike down the creek. I think you say crick, but I say creek. <laughs> um, and there was not a single kid along that um, stream. And it really upset me. So I read the book by Rich Love and I reached out to him. and. Um, uh, sent him a note and he personally answered it and invited me to a national meeting at the Arbor Day Foundation, which is in Lincoln, Nebraska. And it's an amazing facility. And there were about 150 thought leaders from all over the world, from recreation, from uh, conservatories, from public gardens, from Audubon, from um, education, human services, counseling. And we designed the Children in Nature Network. Um, it since has grown, it is a free membership that you can join. And we made a commitment in New Jersey with our organization to get kids outside. And so we decided that we would have this event uh, at Rutgers Gardens in tandem and partnership with Rutgers Gardens, which I don't know if you know where that is, but it's in um, Millville, New Jersey just on the other side of Route 1 from Cook Campus um, at Rutgers, uh, New Brunswick. And it is our state botanical garden. It's a research garden. I'm actually on the board and so is my husband, um, but they hosted it. And that is where the headquarters of the uh, Garden State uh, Gardener, Gardener Clubs are. So all the garden clubs in the state, that's what their headquarters are. And we had an amazing convening. We had people from Department of Ed, Human Services, uh, we had some legislators and we did an all day event um, from nature based organizations, providers, garden club ladies, um, uh, the landscape uh, industry, the um, nursery industry was represented, nursery in terms of uh, plants, people that raise plants. And we had a long day looking at issues that we can work on to encourage kids to be outside. So I remember that day and there was a lot of people around the table. And you were bringing together all these stakeholders to make a connection between the importance of outdoor play and after school. And we did an activity that you do when you do trainings. And I just wanna ask you to share it with people watching because it is a great activity that walks you back in time to remember when, uh -huh. where you were when you were a kid, I'll let you talk about it. But when you did this activity, it made all these groups come together for the purpose, which was to highlight the importance of how after school can help get kids outside. So tell the wa okay. watchers about the activity that you can do with your program. So what you need to remember is that as an after school program, you are a maker of memories. You're the new, the new backyard. You're the new neighborhood. So the activity we did, I asked people to think um, what they did when they were five, when they were seven, and when they were ten um, after school. Who were they with? Where did they go and what did they do? And it was fascinating some of the things that came up. And if you think back about it, I grew up, I went to Catholic school where I wore a uniform. 
the first thing I did was go home and change my clothes, grab a snack, grab a book and climb in my tree house and sit there until it was dark because I was one of seven children and it, there was very little time to be alone. And that was my not a lot time. of space in your house. Either. Not a lot of space. No, no. Very <laughs> little space. Outside. Yes. So the tree house was mine. No one was allowed. I built it. It's in my white oak tree. And that was even in the winter, I'd be up there with a thermostat of uh, hot chocolate and a book and a blanket. And I would read my Anna Green Gables books and my Secret Garden book by uh, Francis Hudson Ernest. So clearly your love of nature and out outside came from when you were young. That's right. And it was fostered and cultivated throughout the years. And as you grew up, you always remember to spend time outside. And that day when everybody put up their charts of what they did outside when they were young people, it was so similar, even if they were in cities or in the country, um, which leads back to the Richard Louvre book, uh, Where Do the Children Play, right? Is mm -hmm. the name of it? Or Last Child in the Woods. Last Child in the Woods. There was also a Where Did the Children Place by video. Elizabeth Goodenough. Right. Which you have a copy of. So that right. same day that we all first like got grounded in why it's important to recognize after school and how it can get kids outside, we all watched this video of Where Do the Children Play. Yes. So talk about that video a little bit. So that's when um, it was fascinating. Elizabeth Goodenough um, was at the University of Ohio and oh Kentucky, I'm sorry. And she did long-term research on the importance of uh, getting kids connected to nature and nature deficit disorder, which is a term that Rich Louvre um, coined with Last Child of the Woods. And it looked at different cultures. It looked at um, kids that were um, indigenous. They were uh, living on an Indian reservation and their family were um, fishermen and how the kids would go out and fish with the family. Uh, the part that's that still stirs my heart is when they had two groups of kids and they separated them and they gave them each the same group of materials. They had cardboard boxes and markers and paint and tape and everything. And they said, um, build your neighborhood. And two groups of kids, uh, totally separate. There was a suburban group and there was an urban group. And uh, the suburban group, built these buildings all by themselves. They didn't work with each other as a team. Um, one kid drew, uh, made a video rental store, remember video stores, that's how long ago it was. Um, there was not a single person, there was nobody outside. There were a couple of trees, but they each came together and they each made their own building and then they put them next to each other. The urban kids had faces in the windows, they had people sitting on their front stoops. They had um, kids playing outside. They had window boxes that they had made on these cardboard houses. That was their community. Those suburban kids weren't outside, weren't connected, drove everywhere, and were totally protected from the outside, from Great. being outside. And, and watching, between reading the book, having the convening, watching that video, and knowing the kids in our after school programs, because at the time, I was an after school provider right. and I was seeing on the video and reading in the book exactly what I was experiencing with the kids in the after school program. Kids who don't play outside or um, only spend a little bit outside time because they're concerned about the elements. Staff, and ticks. Yes, ticks. Staff who were really uncomfortable with going outside and knowing what to do. And all those parts together um, created kind of like the understanding that we needed to address this issue of getting kids to go outside, specifically in our after school program. So you then charged us with developing some tools. Right. And you were the one that developed a, a resource guide. Um, we did a big event at Rutgers Gardens for kids, which was awesome. You we worked on um, getting field trips for kids to encourage them to go outside. Very simple, not like, uh, you know, that a big event was going to happen, but they could look and explore and pick up rocks and look at bugs. Right, because we found a lot of kids just didn't have that experience right. or that time because they're in school till three, they're inside a cafeteria till six, and the staff didn't know what to do. Right. So we had developed a toolkit, which is still available now on the website. You can download and do those activities, which are like making bird feeders and putting out a piece of fruit and watching what bugs show up at the piece of fruit or, um, or ideas of where you can go within the state to explore and touch nature and all of it is about being outside, right. 
And at that time, screen time was critical. I mean, families were dealing with the whole issue of kids wanted, um, and parents and families wanted kids to bring handheld games for gaming during the day, because then the kids would, that was a deal that they do their homework and they could play. They didn't want to go outside. And we were worried then about the amount of screen time they have. Now you look at how much screen time with COVID that our kids have had. I can't even begin to chart it. So let's talk about that a little bit. Right now, all of our kids are glued to a screen from eight to one. My kids have school till 3.30 online. So how important now is outside and nature and how how do we do it, you know? And why is it important now, especially? You know, I think one thing COVID has taught us, I hope, um, Starting last March in my neighborhood, I saw kids that I had honestly and truly did not even know lived on my block. I saw kids learning to ride bikes uh, because their parents never had the time because they were all working and driving into the city. Uh, Every night, I still see families taking a walk in the neighborhood, including my husband and I. When we lived in England, every single night, every night before dusk, Everybody in my whole development, they need to go for a walk. People went for walks. People don't do that. In so COVID actually made people they go did. outside more and exactly. spend more time outside. So yeah. now here we have after school programs. Right. And now they're starting back. So we want to get those kids out where it's fresh. We don't have to work. Like if you notice, Sarah and I are both doubly vaccinated. We are outside. We could actually technically even sit closer, but we aren't. <laughs> We're over here. Um, but that whole idea of being outside and outside, which has resonated throughout the last year and a half is being the safest place to be. Um, So I think we need to work on helping kids and staff and families also re-enter into that realm. Right. And it's very safe inside your house or your apartment or your classroom but we need these kids outside connecting with nature, looking for sow bugs, looking in the cracks. It doesn't, you don't have to be in a suburban playground, an urban playground. And I used to do a workshop where we would do a walk through um, urban playgrounds and we could identify like probably 15 different wildflowers or plants in a matter of like 20 feet, like, you know, pineapple chamomile and, you know, vinca. So did you know all the names of these things? No before you started no I had to learn. kids outside and no, walking with no, kids. I have okay. my little and I'll tell you now with your phone you can have this plant app which is unbelievable um because it'll tell you immediately what it is I took Latin for four years and I never remember the Latin names of plants my husband never took Latin and he remembers the Latin names <laughs> so I know the common names like Culver's root or lady slipper or um milkweed or whatever so at the same time all this was kind of happening when we were starting about 12 years ago, I also was introduced to the Monarch Teachers Network, which at that time was hosted at EIRC. And I started raising monarch butterflies. So my whole life, my whole gardening experience in my front garden is focused on how to rear butterflies. And last year was the first year I did not do a release at an after school program or a camp or a childcare center, but I'd average about 200, 300. Um, monarchs that I hand harvest and raise and release them and teach kids how to hold butterflies, what their life cycle's like, how to tag them, to release them, to track so their migratory. Not only habits. gardening, I mean, it's connected butterflies. And, right, um, pollinators. Pollinators and gardening, but um, there's lots of ways to get outside. Tons if, of ways. If, if you like the garden, if you like plants, if you like insects and pollinators, um, if you like farms, if you like exploring water there's lots of ways to get local kids parks um playgrounds it's and it, you know when i remember um this woman who ran the um american garden um association came to, for a tour of my garden a couple of years ago and i was said to her you know my hope is to really cultivate and grow kids to be gardeners and she said don't worry about them becoming gardeners they worry about them exposing the key is to expose them to nature and gardens and later in life they will return i love that yeah so you she had the american gardening association at her house so we're gonna go to your 
American Gardening Association recognized. Now garden. remember, we're in between. <laughs> we're in between the seasons, so we're gonna walk through, and you're gonna show us some things right. that we might see in our own neighborhoods, or even some new things um, that will spark our interest, and that are just really cool to look at and touch and feel. And even though you may not have this resource in your neighborhood, you do have your parks, your county parks, your state parks, um, your garden centers, your environmental education centers. There's so many places that you can get kids yourself or even direct them and their families to. So uh, come along with us as we walk through the garden. And then I'm just always gonna remind you to check out the website for additional resources and activities. And Diane's going to show us some of these things that she just talked about. So, so. many gardens, public gardens, have um, art. And I really believe you can't separate art from nature. So um, one thing that we have is a commissioned piece from a uh, sculptress called Marcia Donahue from Berkeley, California. And we live under a twin um, oak tree. It's a pin oak. So we have a pin oak mala where she made handcrafted, beautiful clay beads. Can I feel it? Yep, you can feel it. They're heavy. Oh, this is heavy. Yeah. This is an acorn. Yeah. And it's a <laughs> pin oak acorn. And um, she designed a necklace to encircle our tree. And it's attached to our house and encircles our, our oak, oak tree. Our house is called Oak House. Um, in honor of the trees. When we lived in England, everybody named their houses after plants. I was wondering trees. why you called it Yes, Oak House. everybody okay. like Rose Cottage or, you know, um, Primrose Way or something. So we I have, have to a, think of a name for my house. Yes, I, I love naming it. Marigold's um, yes. Basil. Yes, Cottage. Basil, basil Cottage. <laughs> yes, I like that. So um, we're on Zoom, not on a regular phone. So I'm going to go out of the screen here and okay. follow you. All right. As you take us through your garden, I'm going to be careful walking. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you look and, down. Um, we're we going to just I, again remind you guys grab some lunch, and we're going to go on tour of this garden. So, Diane. Okay. Now, what do I do? Walk I I'm going to turn this to you. Okay. okay All right. So. so this is what I look out on. Okay. Um, and uh, my husband and I designed this over 30 years. We have many different rooms with different types of plantings. And we do all the work ourselves. We do not hire anybody. We do not put our leaves out. We mulch them all. We don't use any pesticides or chemicals. I do not raise vegetables because I grew up in a farming family. My great uncles were all grape farmers and fruit farmers. And the idea of raising tomatoes to me, I just can't even do that. So I just go to the local farm stand. All right, we'll be careful walking down. and. You don't need to look back. Okay. I will follow you guys. I'll follow you. There's the acorn mala that she was talking about. So we are going down. Okay. Don't fall. Don't fall. Okay. So I have a mix of native plants, and native plants are ones that um, I buy cultivated ones. I don't go out in the wild and dig them up. Um, but this is my epimedium collection here under my azalea and I have some foam flowers and these have a really pretty little flower it looks like almost like a fairy flower Isn't that beautiful so I have different colors under here and they love being under azaleas um this azalea was planted in 1952 it was a mother's day um azalea plant and when we bought the house um the owners told me and I was born in 1952 so this is 69 years old and also the wisteria was planted then. Um, so I love this idea that it's, this is kind of on its way out, but it is a beautiful azalea. Um, I have that at my house. I love them. We yes. never had those in Buffalo. Sorry. This is a native rhododendra. So that'll bloom more in June as big pink flowers. Look at that massive leaf right there. What yes. is that? That is called. Look at this people massive leaf. I love Here's it. my hand. There's the I leaf. It. It's pretty big. This is called pedicetes. Um, it actually is not native, it's from China. Um, some people call it dragon food. And it, uh, I love it, uh, I love big leaves. So actually when we're in the hot tub at night, if the moon rises over that way, the leaves will actually turn toward the moon. You can watch them when you're in a hot tub turn, fascinating. But these get kind of ratty toward the end of the year. It's interspersed with um, hostas, but uh, I love it, I think they're, anything that I can get some big green leaves for. And these are some native dogwood. This is the new red- Wait, Diane, 
I want to remind when we went to Rutgers Gardens, so we planned a field trip for the kids from New Brunswick to go to Rutgers Gardens. And even though New Brunswick, the city is not far from the gardens, it was a long trip for them to get there. And when they got off, they only got to do a couple of things. And one thing they got to do was pick a leaf. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. So they picked leaves yeah. that were the size of these beautiful leaves right here. And that was it. And you would have thought they had made they had <laughs> it was so cool for them to just be able to go out and explore and pick some leaves safely and and wave them around at each other, which and I want to do right now, but I'm not going to pick your leaves. I will say this. My grandsons okay. who are three and four love these giant leaves they are bigger than they are. And these are just started. So um, and these are some native um, geraniums, which will start to bloom soon. And deer do not like them, but aren't those pretty? I love these. Sarah, you're going to get some of these. Some hydrangeas. These are my hell, some of my hellebores. This is a pergola. So this is our first room. And this is where we spend a lot of time um, having dinner. We have a pizza oven there. There's a little house wren building a nest. She's probably not happy we're standing here. Um, I have water that they love bubbling water. Birds, if you want to attract birds anywhere, they love any kind of water movement in here. There she is, she's up there. She's not happy that we are near her nest. But this is where we spend most of our time in the summer. Um, and there's a lot of native plants like the Look at these forest. down here. I want everybody to see these, these cool these little cool. plants. So these used to be called Lenten roses. My grandmother had them. They start blooming in March. This is also um, wild. This is native ginger. So this is a wild ginger, which smells pretty cool. I thought that was a weed. No. Oh, no. Well, I'm yeah, learning a lot of things ginger. today. <laughs> So this is filled with different hydrangeas, but most of my uh, daffodils are gone now. We probably have about, well, probably, I think probably about 800 daffodils interspersed in here. And also I have this wonderful thing that people hate, but I don't mind it because I can't get rid of it. It's called celadine, called celadine. And about two weeks ago, all the undergrowth here, this is an invasive species, but you can't get rid of it unless you like use a, uh, a herbicide, which I will not use, um, has beautiful yellow flowers. So this was all yellow, the undergrowth. And as soon as it gets hot, it dies back and the worms eat it. And then they poop out worm castings. And then I have a whole layer of really healthy dirt. Nice. And it's free. <laughs> what is that beautiful pink thing over there? Where? Hanging uh, down. That's called bleeding heart. Isn't that beautiful? I love that. Yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? That's gorgeous. I know. They used to say that if you open it, it looks like a woman inside. I don't want to even go there, but yes. <laughs> but it's pretty. I have them in white. And <laughs> so. this is a red, that's a native apple. These are all, like I said, native. Um, this will all be, these are hydrangeas. Let's go back to... Um, the fish pond, the next room. Oh, here's my spotty daddy. I love this. She blooming. So she's going to bloom. That's a, um, actually, it's from China. It's a May apple. Um, and that's a Franconia. And there it just bloomed. Here's more uh, ginger. But in here, I have um, some trout lilies that are on their way out. Those are native. A lot of these are native ferns. Um, and then I have May apples, which are native. Oh, Diane, before we walk through and you have this oh, little God. section here, mm -hmm. tell us about this and how this could be cool in your after school program. First too. time I saw this was at the, um, uh, when I was at the Children in Nature Conference at the um, National um, Arbor Day Foundation. And you can buy these from Amazon. They're like gazing balls, but they're metal. They're very light. And they had these in a basket and kids would take them and walk around with them. So I don't know if you can see the reflection. It's a little distorted because of the shape of the ball, but they can they can walk and see themselves and it's they can see all the way up. I love it. My grandkids walk around with these all the time. She has them tucked into places. Because they pick up light. Yeah. And it's just very cool. Here's one. And that's my European beach, which I absolutely love. It looks like an elephant, I think. The boy, my grandsons like to sit on it because they say they're sitting on the, the legs of an elephant. Doesn't it look that way? Yeah, 
know. these are English bluebells. Um, they'll disappear. So when a plant grows and disappears, like those ones that are dying, they're called ephemeral because it means that they bloom in spring or, or a different time and they just disappear. You never know they were there because they just kind of, so this is a native May apple. And I was very lucky. These were all here when we moved in. I just love it. I feel like you could have kids pick a little bouquet and draw what they see and magnifying glasses are awesome for kids to have um also mirrors because many times you can't see under a leaf and if they hold a mirror um like a plastic mirror then they can see the reflection right of what they're looking at so even times. just getting um a few mirrors mm -hmm. some magnifying glasses you could do this anywhere it doesn't need to be in a this is a hawthorn tree so it's called garden. an understory tree and you have to have hawthorns um, if you want fairies to come to your garden. Oh, yes. Okay. So if you want fairies, and I do have fairies, so I have my hawthorn. But the fairies need them. Okay. <laughs> and this is my, I don't know what you want to call it. I'm going to call this the pond garden. This pond was built in 1931. And when we moved here, this was all woods. I cleared it all myself. Um, and drag the trees out. And my husband built paths. And this is the first structure we built. And then, um, but I thought I had some kind of druid circle because there were these rocks in a circle when I took the trees out. And it was a fish pound that they had built in 1931. We still have the original rock. And Any of the original fish? No. no. <laughs> no. I put this here so um, the pollen out. But I have um, goldfish. So we're going to. Minnows. And then my frog isn't awake yet. Um, but I'll get new tadpoles. Is that one of those balls in there? Yes, I have that float in there because the um, we have a blue heron who's probably as tall as I am, and he looks very prehistoric. That's one reason I keep this on until I get plants that grow in here. It has to be warmer. He could fish out that entire pond in Wait, a day. There's a bird around here as tall as us. Oh yeah, it's like this, right, oh. Dagmar? You've seen them. They're like they give you the heebie-jeebies, and. Uh, and I'll find him like sitting up on my tea house or, you know, he could fish out the whole thing. But if you have a uh, ball floating, then it kind of gets them freaked out. If they don't, but he could stand in the pond okay. and just eat everything. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, but once I get the green, um, the plants growing, um, when it gets warmer, then he won't be there. He okay. won't bother. So and this is my current bushes. Are smoke bushes, are cardinal flowers, tons of ferns. Um, all these ferns started with one fern. Uh, hard to believe. So you can, can Wait. you take a fern and bring it inside and grow it? No, oh. not a native. Not a native. Yeah. Okay. No. You would have a tropical fern. Oh. But you could be leaf prints with them. Oh, what's a leaf print? A leaf prints when you take a piece. I love ferns. I always wanted to have my fence be that. You take a piece of fern and you put paint on it and then you put a piece of paper on top of it and then you have a print isn't that beautiful that's beautiful and I love that. i've got a bunch of different types. i thought you were talking about leaf rubbings oh you could do leaf rubbings that that'd be hard to do a leaf rubbing on though you want something that's got more texture on the leaf that's not like something like this would be a good leaf print. this is an oak leaf hydrangea um, this question, is actually what's called leaf rubbing Ella. A leaf rubbing is when you put a piece of paper on top on of top. a leaf. This would be good for this one. And you use yeah. a crayon, right? Yeah, a crayon that you peel and you can rub back and forth and you'll get the, um, the indentation. Right. So if you have your kids choose a different, several different kinds of leaves and different crayon colors, they can do some leaf rubbings and people can then do a little scavenger hunt and figure out where those leaves came from. Lots of, you know, shoot off activities from from just a leaf really yeah. yeah and you can have them do a leaf journal that way yes you know you could even have a notebook and then skip the other of their page this is um a buckeye which is a native it'll have like little chestnuts is it from ohio no oh native new jersey <laughs> it, it is. it's well, a new jersey an plant yeah. okay and this is my, where's um, the scarlet knight the scarlet knight we walked by is a oh, dogwood. Okay. she hasn't bloomed yet okay right? 
This is a Dawn Red. They made one. that up. It oh, exists. we did a Starlight Night. No, I have a Starlight Night Red one. It's a cultivar from uh, Rutgers, and it is uh, virus resistant. Because many, we lost a lot of dogwoods in New Jersey due to a virus, and oh. they've made it resistant. Okay. This is a Dawn Redwood, which actually is a baby of a redwood from the original Frick estate. What is so, that? You know, the Frick family, the Frick Museum in New York. Oh, yes. So this is a Dawn Redwood that they imported. And um, I bought that baby. She'll be about 40 feet tall in about 10 years. Wow. Yeah, she's beautiful. I love all the little peaks of color throughout, and it changes all throughout the season, right? Yeah. These are, um, one thing you've got to know if you want kids to be outside is you need to identify poison ivy. I have very little poison ivy, but that's one problem if you bring kids to a park, like Rutgers Gardens has a lot of poison ivy. But this is jewelweed. Jewelweed will have like um, a yellow and orange kind of flower. Um, if you do get poison ivy, you can go like this. And after you wash the oil out, if you rub it on your skin, it takes the bite off of it. Oh. Yeah. So I always have that because I have a lot of food. So speaking of identifying poison ivy, Diane had mentioned a plant finder app. You know, if you're going to take kids out, it would help to download that so you know what you're going to have the kids um, not touch. Yeah. <laughs> we want them to touch. What do we not want them to touch? Poison ivy. So back here, it's all designed for birds. Um, so I have uh, high bush blueberries. I have elderberry. I have... Um, Lilac, I have a lot of the migrating birds to come back here, like the yellow warblers, and um, I have wild raspberries, and this is all for the birds. So um, one thing to think about is a free activity to do with kids is take them bird watching. They could each have a bird journal. They, kids love binoculars. Sometimes you can get donated binoculars from, um, I know the bird seed store in Scotch Plains, he'll collect binoculars from people because people always kind of scale up and get a more um, expensive one. Um, but many people donate their lenses and binoculars for kids to um, bird watch and even start a bird watching journal. If you have a program near a cemetery, that is the best place in the world to bird watch. Interesting. I love it. Look at, that, look at that tree right there. Or it's a, it's got like a stair step of leaves coming up out of it. Yes. See, there's the longest one that goes. This one? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Oh, this is an elderberry. Okay. It's a wild elderberry. It's yeah. cool how it's growing. Did you plan that or just no, did it? Just, they just come <laughs> up. how it did. <laughs> and it'll have a big bloom of white flowers. You see them a lot of times when you drive along the highway. Um, and then they have little purple flowers or little purple berries. And um, my grandmother used to make elderberry wine out of it. When I lived in England, I would make elderberry pie, which isn't very tasty, but. Um, and are these blueberries right there? Those are blueberries. Those are high bush. Yep. So it's really cool. I mean, I know you don't grow food, but having kids see where food is grown. Yes. And one thing when we went to Rutgers Gardens, one of the most memorable things is when we had a group of kids come and uh, they got to plant. This one kid said to me, he was, remember, he was like the eighth grader. He had like the droopy pants. He was he the was oldest really kid. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And he was so hot and cool. And he said, ma'am, I've heard it said that tomatoes grow on a plant. I'd like to see that someday. And his father was a Mexican worker, um, a farm worker who had come to the United States who now worked in landscaping, but you know, no longer was a farm worker. And here this kid had never seen a tomato and he got to take the plant home to put on his fire escape. And he was so thrilled to see that he could get an actual tomato plant because they think everything was wrapped up with celibate. Right, so even, I mean, that's not a screen. There's no right. immediate reward, but uh, that made an impact on a child to you have know, and see. A, I mean, you hear a, a lot there. of kids too are doing, um, with COVID have started vegetable gardens. Like you guys, your kids are involved in vegetable gardening. Yes. Um, you know, that wasn't something you probably thought about five years ago. No, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I know several friends whose grandkids started their own garden. My grandkids have their own vegetable garden now and fruit and strawberries. And because we're home, you know, we didn't have that. So, else. I'm just noticing this is the pollinator area, you said, and bees are pollinators. Yeah. There's a lot of bees around here. A ton of them. What do you think about that? Well, I am mean, not allergic to bees. Okay. So I, you know, 
you want to check your kids before you go. Yeah. Make sure you have yeah. all the things you need. And I'll tell you, they could care less about me right now because what they want is the nectar. Um, and when they take, you can smell it. Oh my gosh. It smells so good. There's I really wish there. you guys could smell this purple flower right here. I, I mean, it's like, I hate to compare it to Bed Bath, not Bed Bath Neon, Bath and Body Works, but it's like real natural Bath and Body Works right here. You know, and people are afraid of bees and rightly so because they don't understand them. Um, but a real bee, hornet, you don't want your kid anywhere near a hornet um, because they are aggressive. We actually have an influx now of European hornets, which we had actually in our tree out in front of our house, my neighbor's house. And it found, I didn't realize, I couldn't figure out why I didn't have that many caterpillars. Evidently they will eat monarch caterpillars and they were so aggressive, you couldn't even walk outside. But you can see now we have tons of bees around here. I mean, they're teeny, teeny, teeny bees. So I know a lot of people are scared of bees and would be hesitant to take their kids to do something like this because of it. So some bee education could not hurt and dagmar our staff person is a beekeeper so she would be excellent for this let's skip that part we don't want to see where we trap the ground um and this is my tea house everybody doing okay awesome so say that again Diane. This is my tea house okay so this is all made um from recycled materials up, up cycling again Wow. So most of the stuff came from junk day, like that window. People just give me teapots and um, somebody just gave me a whole Turkish tea set. Um, and kids in the neighborhood, if they want, they can schedule a time or friends of mine can schedule time with their kids. Um, and I will set the table with, with China and everything. And they bring a little picnic and have their own tea house, tea party. You know what, that's a actually cute after school activity. A take your party? take your snack outside. Mm -hmm. Have a tea party. Experience some of the nature. These are the doors from the first Baptist church where our office is. They were throwing them out. So this is my this is my hummingbird garden. Um, things are starting to come up. Tons of jewelweed. Um, these are my hummingbird sticks. So these are so cool. I think that can an after school program make something like this? Yeah, why not? These are just tomato steaks that we spray painted and glued um, little mirrors on that I got from like the craft store. And hummingbirds, when all of this stuff, like there's Wigilia and a different, different plants here that'll all bloom, it's still low yet. Um, hummingbirds are very territorial. So they will see themselves in the mirror and they go nuts because they think it's another hummingbird. So and what do they, they do? Hover. They will just hover in front of it, like kind of having a standoff with themselves. <laughs> they don't know that, right? Yeah. yeah. So here's my Davidia tree. This is the handkerchief tree. These are pretty rare. These are handkerchiefs. I see them. And you see the white handkerchiefs? They're bracts. They're, they aren't really flowers. They're leaves. See if you could spot them, guys. I love this tree. And Sometimes they call it a dove tree because it looks like it's filled with white doves in the spring. This one also smells nice. Yes, indeed. This is my banana, which is not native, but it's just starting to come up. But last year it was about 15 feet tall and it's just fun. This is fun stuff. Um, Does it make a banana? Like a No, <laughs> if it did, it would make the kind they make rope out of, not the kind you can eat. But um, And that is my... Um, um, bind for pipe vine swallowtails. It's the only food that the caterpillar of pipe vine um, swallowtails eat. So they, I need that. And they're the big, beautiful blue butterflies that you see. So all of this is, is connected to your monarch butterfly. And butterfly in nature. And, yeah. and you, it's a way station? We are a certified way station. And we're also certified by the National Wildlife um, Society for um, have being a wildlife um, to support wildlife it's because we have water features. We don't use pesticides. We have dead we keep dead trees because the um, insects need them and like the woodpeckers need them. Um, so yeah, this is another. Um, this is a cultivatable thing. So we've, I don't have much um, light back here. So. Um, 
Oh, and that's my calacanthus. I don't know if you can see that. It's a beautiful. See the red blossoms or spice bush? I don't know if the viewers can yeah, see it. Walk over. It is beautiful. Okay, guys. That's a native. I'm going into walk the. Yeah. Look, I'm going to show you. I'm going into the bushes here. It's very soft. <laughs> oh, those are so pretty. They smell heavenly. Beautiful. Really pretty. Now, this is not necessarily stuff you're going to see around the neighborhood, but if you were just a regular person where would you go like where would i go to look for plants like this yeah a public garden like um rutgers or greenwood gardens or up um uh, skyland pearl s buck there are gardens um and small arboretums and small botanical parks you'd be shocked how many there are if you look up garden state uh, gardens there's actually a um network of different town and city gardens. And you'd be shocked at where they are. Uh, that's um, Speaking of that, I'm gonna turn the camera and you're gonna walk towards the front to show us some of the butterfly stuff. And I'm gonna talk about the remainder of May mm -hmm. and where they can get more okay. information. So right. I'll follow you. So hi everybody. I hope you enjoyed the tour of the backyard garden. We're gonna walk towards the front, but I was, as I'm walking, I wanna remind everybody that all month long, every Wednesday, there is a celebrate after school outdoors in the garden state lunch and learn at 1230. Last week we had young audiences perform and do a social emotional um, celebration, um, things that you can do in your programs with storytelling and connecting to nature. And you can believe check out the archive of that. And today we're with Diane Jenko in her garden talking about the whole celebrate after school concept and where it came from and why it's important. Next Wednesday, we have Lisa Pitts from Hunger Free New Jersey, because this summer, um, and Diane can concur, the federal guidelines for summer meals have been, are relaxed. So there'll be opportunities to feed more kids in the summer. So definitely log in to watch and hear about that. And then we have Tanisha Malcolm from the Nature Conservancy. It's a national organization, but they have feet in New Jersey now, trying to bring um, children in urban environments connect them with nature. And since we are doing that work too, it's an awesome time for us to get together and see what they have to offer. So make sure you join us for the next two Wednesdays and every Friday, check out the After School Flash. There's some activities, there's links to these places that we've been talking about so you can check it out yourself. And with that, we are in a whole nother room in the garden. I'm gonna turn the camera back around. Whoa, that's gorgeous. Oh, those are, um, <laughs> these are Japanese fantail, um, Pussy willows, and I actually went to the Pussy Willow Farm in Lancaster, PA, to buy them this year because they weren't at the if it was no flower show. And this is the first time because the farmer cut them fresh. I have pots of them that are rooted, and they have this twisty, bizarre little. So I'm hoping I'll actually be able to get a fantail pussy willow bush because you can just cut a pussy willow and just stick it in water and it'll root. It's like a it's a willow, so it's wild. There's so you can my, also get those at Trader Joe's, right? Yep, Sometimes. you can. So you can do it in your program too. So this is my pride and joy. This is its third year. It's cultivated. It's not captured in the wild from Catskill Nursery. And it is a yellow lady slipper next to a yellow trillium. And it makes my heart just sore when I see it. And uh, there's tons of trillium here kind of on the end. There's one with a red one. That's variegated Solomon seal. That's a native. This is the, I remember, bleeding That's heart. Bleeding heart. But it, it is like white. Heart, right? And this looks like asparagus. Oh, those are bluebells. Well, <laughs> don't eat those. They look <laughs> del delicious, but I will right. eat them. Some people find this invasive, but I need this for my migrating monarchs. Um, it's hard to get a lot of nectar sources in September. And this is my butterfly bush. I have one, one butterfly bush. Um, because it'll have flowers late. These Beautiful. are my white violets that I actually got the seeds in England two years ago. You can eat those, right? Yeah, candy them and eat them. Yeah. So we have them in our yard, but they're purple. You have the state flower. So the state flower is the violet. Yes, it is. It's purple. It is. And if you cut those blossoms um, and you paint them with egg white, dilute egg white and you put ultra fine sugar on them and let them dry in a wax paper you can have candy violets i used to always do that so we'll write that up for the next flash so that you guys can candy violets and here's another you can candy your state flower in your 
after school program as you're celebrating outdoors in the Garden State. Hold on. That's a trillium. That's native. Yeah. These are so pretty. I know. This is the woodruff. This is called the Mayflower. They make May wine out of it. My birthday is May Day. So what you're supposed to do is take the blossoms and the greens and float them in um, wine. Let's skip over your okay. house here. You made these planters, right? Yeah, except for this one. Yeah, yeah these are called troughs, hypertrophy troughs. And um, these stay out all winter. And those are succulents, right? Yep, most of them are succulents or uh, conifers, yep. Look at this one, it looks like a little village. <laughs> See here, I've got my little knight. I don't know where my, here's the, here's the my kid, grandkids play, here's my. I love that. When I was a kid and we watched TV, I would see the Matchbox commercials and how they would take their Matchbox outside and make tracks. And the... <laughs> I want to do that so bad. That's what that looks like. So now we're only have vegetables. I have this in this. Those are my strawberries. So here's my milkweed. Okay. What is milkweed? This is native milkweed. Um, this is the only plant that monarch butterflies will lay their eggs on. There's different varieties of milkweed. I have about five different varieties. Um, this is the native, uh, which will bloom very soon, a really pretty pink blossom. Um, but that's called a host plant. So a butterfly needs a host plant. They're gonna lay their eggs on something underneath and they'll, I'll start to see them in June. They'll lay it underneath and then they will, you'll, I collect the little eggs. These are soft, furry, right? They are furry, yeah. And they also have, See, milk. Yeah. Can you eat that? Oh, uh, no. Okay. No, 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 no. This is late text. Just checking. Um, just checking. <laughs> when I was a kid, I would write my name and then like sit out in the sun and then I could, um, it would make like a resist. So I'd have my name and this would get like sunburned. Oh, but, a tattoo from yeah. the milkweed. We yes. will not write that up and no. put it in the no. guide next week. Yeah. But so you know what happened. <laughs> I have, um, here's our way station notification. So we're certified. So that means that they have shelter, they have water, um, there's no pesticides, they have a nectar source, which is a flower. So it's, remember when they're migrating, um, we go through five different broods of um, caterpillars, so, I mean of um, monarchs. So the ones that come in January are not the ones that fly away in August and September. That's the fifth brood um, that go to Mexico. So they need something sweet to eat to sustain them on their migration path. And it's hard to find a lot of that around in September. So I have um, goldenrod, I have um, a lot, they love asters. I have native asters in the front. Um, so I see there's a monarchwatch.org. Is that something that people can go online? Yes, they totally And can. find the local way station by yep, them? You can right, find your registered station or you can, um, there's information on how to rear mar migrant uh, monarchs, how to track their migration. Um, I, it's the only butterfly that you can really like handle, like you can, it can sit on you. They can, you know, a lot of people, um, raise painted ladies. It's a kit that you buy. Those were not native to New Jersey. They're considered native now because so many people have released them <laughs> that, um, you know, they're present in our ecology now, but. So I know that, um. You're very passionate about butterflies. You've helped kids become passionate. And then we also, your daughter did some work for us. And it's a resource on the website right. that after school programs can use to explore butterflies. It's how you can um, make a butterfly garden in your schoolyard. Uh, you can use a Rubbermaid tote with holes in the bottom. Um, you could actually grow vegetables like that. I mean, these are the only vegetables I grow in herbs. Um, so is that's this what you guys are eating every day? Yeah, I do all my own lettuce and everything and I've got different herbs. Um, uh, the arugula is bolted, but I can still get some of that. Here are my chives. And I don't have much sunlight. So there's no, you could do this with kids in a, um, in a, in a trough, in a bin or a made bin. My sister in Jamestown, New York, used to work for a church and they actually had an entire free vegetable garden where um, volunteers say everything was planted in troughs, in uh, tug, trucks, trucks, like that they put holes in the bottom and they had tomato plants, everything else. And if you volunteered, you could harvest, help harvest them. Nice. 
Uh, there's some really cool things. I've never seen lettuce that looks like that before. Oh, you have it? No. I, like I have cilantro. This is borage, which I love. Um, it, this actually, if you're interested um, in pollinators, um, once this blooms, it is a beautiful blue flower. And if the nectar is depleted, like if a bee drains the nectar, it will totally replenish itself in 20 minutes. What? Yep. That's amazing. So I'm really big. And this is, tastes great in a cocktail. Um, <laughs> so, so this had about a thousand daffodils. Um, uh, so this is where you plant things so the butterflies come. Yep. It's like a uh, bee bomb. It's called bee bomb. Um, that's for the hummingbirds. I have a lot of natives in here. I've rattlesnake root, cultures root. I mean, I've hundreds. I don't even know how many plants I have. I noticed there's no grass. No, we don't do grass. <laughs> the only grass we have is a little bit in the back and a little bit in the front. I'd love to get rid of a little bit in the front. So here we are back at the front, Diane. Yes. We have done. A full, are you too much in the sun? No, it's fine. We have done a full tour of the garden. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel relaxed. I mean, just spending the last um, intentional half hour observing the plants and smelling things and touching has helped me feel more relaxed. And I know for a fact, because we read the book, there's research that that will do the same for your kids. And even my own kids at home, they love a nature walk. It's, um, it's fantastic to be outside and just be away from the screen and really enjoy this time. So, so again, yeah, any parting words? Um, that any little bit of exposure you can give kids to nature, to touch it, to feel it, um, to get their hands in the dirt, is so important. And like Sarah, you were saying at Rutgers Gardens, one of the first things that they could actually pick a leaf, mm -hmm. um, you know, let them know what it's like to take, if it's a safe playground or a safe area that they could take their shoes off and feel the grass beneath their feet. Simple things like that make such a difference. Um, the scents, like here's, um, this is lemon balm, I think you can smell it. Um, Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. So I make tea guys, out of that. I mean, I've this got- This smells oh. so good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very great tea. I can I eat this? Obviously I need you lunch. You could eat that. I actually. did not bring my lunch on the lunch and learn. And I want to show you, see here is my <laughs> azalea. Now pollinators are attracted to this. See, there's a, a bee right there. He does not care about me. Because all he or she wants to do, is, I think it's a he actually, um, is to get that pollen. So they are not going to bother me. But if I'm going to go and put my hand on it or um, decide to pet it, like a friend of mine's grandchild did. Um, it's, then you have some issues. Yes, then you've got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we're at the end of our time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for sharing well, thank you. your garden with us and talking to us about the background of Celebrate After School Outdoors in the Garden State. So just remind everybody, um, if it's a daily thing, sharing a fun fact, what's today's fun fact? Do you remember? What's the state flower? The violet. Anyone? Violet. Yes. The What's the state bird? <laughs> What's the state bird? Goldfinch. Yes. Awesome. Oh my God. Are you kidding? How do you know that? I remember wow, when impressive. we used to go to the state house and used to yes. put it up to me on the floor. That's right. The goldfinch. Okay. What's the state fruit? Ooh. That's relatively new. I see a hand. Wait, Hurry up and get unmuted. She's got to find her mute muted. button. What is it, Jess? <laughs> Blueberry. Yes. I was going to say cranberries, but no, I did not no. know that the blueberry. And recently, due to the Garden Club of New Jersey, we now have a state butterfly, which is the yellow swallowtail. Yellow and black swallowtail, oh. which you will see if you have parsley, you'll see it laying its eggs on parsley and these little green caterpillars. And that is our swallowtail. That's, That's a new one. Butterfly. I'll add that to the flash. Yes. So I'm everyone, shocked every that Friday. the state fruit is blueberry because yeah. our, isn't tomato our thing and isn't tomato a fruit? It is a fruit, but it's not our state fruit. It's actually the state. I just read an article the other day. I think it's it's the state fruit of a weird place like Alabama or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, people did not, they did not eat tomatoes until the turn of the century because they thought they were poisonous. 
Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for Celebrate After School Outdoors in the Garden State outside in Diane's garden. Um, just all of you, please take some time yourself to get outside. If you can take a child, take your children, your after school programs if you're together. If you don't have a garden, the, the clouds are out. In fact, that is a cloud above my head. Yes, it's beautiful. And it looks like what? Which one? That one? Yeah. What it a, looks like what a whale. Like? Yeah. It does or a a dolphin, whale and yeah. a duck. I mean, look oh, at yeah. that. Outdoors, outdoors in beautiful New Jersey, a simple activity you guys can do to get your kids out um, with no supplies. So check in with us, check our website. Thanks for Outdoors joining. Outdoors is free. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye.